This is the first Weaving the World Operations call on Wednesday, October 6, 2021. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, I, I think what I'll do, uh, I've got a Google Doc going, which I will um, share on screen right now, just for a sec. Actually, maybe a way to talk, uh, maybe that's a way to talk through it. Um, maybe uh, let's just take uh, a moment to check in and um, find ourselves in this spot. And uh, if at the end of check-in, it makes sense for me to sort of lay some context for where we are and where I think uh, we're heading, that would be great too. So um, how about if we go Hank, Bentley, Stacy? Right, so I'm uh, very excited. It's uh, late afternoon here. I woke up very early this morning and did a positive cartography session online with the Sustainability Hub Norway and uh, 32 uh, business people and entrepreneurs, mostly quite young. Well, let's say 20 somethings, 30 somethings into the 40s. That counts as very, very young. For me, that's very young. Anyway, uh, yeah, it was extremely successful. Uh, it exceeded everyone's uh, expectations, including mine. It was an abbreviated form since ideally you do positive cartography in three days or three weeks. And we had done a, a, a three hour version, but this was a 90 minute version. There were five subgroups. One looked at uh, the future of sustainable business in 2030. Two different groups looked at the future of sustainable business in 2050. And two groups looked at the future of sustainable business in 2099. There were uh, great uh, conversations in all the groups. A uh, lot, of, lot of good ideas, a lot of commitments made, and it tastes like more. So that's uh, my check-in for now. I love your last sentence there. Tastes like more. <laughs> that's fabulous. Um, in the event that they, anybody left behind artifacts that we can point to and that there's a web link for this that session or whatever, um, pass them over just because I'll, I'll curate them into my brain and then they, they can become an artifact as we start weaving the world. Yeah. Um, and feeding the fungus and all that. But um, can, can you give us a taste for what anyone, any one group came up with that stuck in your head that made you like, like this is, this is hitting a, a special note? Oh yeah, uh, uh, global global guidance for new uh, new values, uh, leaders as facilitating uh, uh, organizations, uh, totally re, uh, rethinking the economic systems of the world, uh, uh, a world, uh, a culture of kindness and caring where everyone is very happy to take responsibility for things and take and be accountable for the things they take responsibility for. Stop measuring GDP and financial transactions and start measuring how people contribute to the well being of society, but stop measuring everything there's too much measuring going on and wow well, oh. Like oh cool so this happened on an alternate planet then uh uh well remains to be seen i know uh, i know we got to figure uh, this thing out so it happens on this one yeah well let me just share my screen for a moment i'll, I'll show you a board or two without going into details uh where is the sharing screen icon here one second So we had set up, this was where I was working in uh, 2099. Uh, what's your preferred uh, future for sustainable business seven generations from today on the verge of a new millennium? Uh, people chose uh, photos uh, or images or uploaded their own. Uh, sense making and storytelling zone. Uh, lots of input from the group. It all went so fast, there was hardly time mm. to move on to uh, uh, journey making. What are the steps in an emerging process? How do we think to get there in, uh, in the next seven generations? Uh, 
lots of new ideas and a whole set of uh, commitments that people said we're going to do it. Uh, so uh, that's just one of the examples. There were five boards like that. Uh, cool. But uh, it's a young group. We were so enthusiastic. They said, let's, let's do more of this. We've, we've never experienced something so positive. Uh, everyone is, I mean, it's a sustainability hub and they're all worried about the collapse of, uh, of ecosystems and climate catastrophes. And this game just got them. And especially in the 2030 and the 2050 groups got them into rethinking their own strategies as people, but as entrepreneurs and business leaders. Very, very happy about it. Love that, thank you. And you're giving me good ideas for workshops too. Um, that's really helpful. Um, Bentley, Stacy. So uh, I'm a little tired today, so I'm not sure how effective I'll be. Um, I woke up thinking about logos, both for my brother's project business and weaving the world. So uh, that's where my head is at. Cool, thank you. Um, it turns out that one of the employees at Ziba uh, is a textile artist. She has a degree in textile arts and then sort of shifted out of that once she graduated and couldn't really find a way to make that work. But I talked with her about maybe getting together and looking at some of her stuff and just taking some photographs, uh, maybe producing something. I don't know, We're, we just sort of explored the, the terrain because I was talking about the weaving metaphor and how that all works. So um, she will hopefully dip into some of our calls, but I think uh, she's, she got all, all very excited about going back into the work she cares about uh, metaphorically for, for around these, this work. So that was kind of cool. That'd be great. Yep. Um, Stacy, Collins, then Pete. I'll, I'll save my time for checkout. I'm excited. I want to get started. Awesome. Klaus, Pete. Yeah, it's, uh, it's busy. I, it's impossible to keep up at the moment in the regenerative agriculture space because the uh, UN summit is focused on food this year and, and the uh, surrounding initiatives are just incredible. So there's an interesting split happening between the United States in partnership with Brazil and, and uh, UAE of all places, United Arab Emirates, because they are producing uh, synthetic nitrogen with their flare of gas you know, there's a contribution there. And uh, apparently the rest of the world, uh, Germany leading, <clears throat> pulling uh, China, Korea, Japan, other big, big players, uh, the Africa into this uh, regenerative movement. Um, and uh, the split is, is, is profoundly difficult for the multinational companies who rely on monocrop cultures. Uh, and so the, here in the US, <clears throat> we are pushing also now concerted on, on uh, monocrop cultures as the root cause for the environmental degradation, because when you put the same crop into the ground over and over, you then rely on chemicals to keep that thing alive. So that's, that's, um, that's exciting. It's creating enormous tensions in the political process, as you can imagine. I mean, all this noise obviously has underlying reasons you know, from, from, from behind there. So that's, that's, that's amazing stuff. But uh, I'm onboarding with, uh, with this group on, on, uh, on, on Friday as a brand strategy consultant. Um, it's the, uh, I, I can't for some reason ever, it's planetary care. And that's a pretty, pretty big group. They have over 50 members. Uh, they just got uh, a million dollar uh, uh, grant. So it's it's uh, uh, and 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 have some some really viable projects. So I'm excited about that. So I will have to talk some other things to uh, to focus uh, on my time. So when you say uh, onboarding, you mean as an advisor? It looks like they have as a partner. Wow, cool. Yeah, <clears throat> that's his forest. You know, he was he has been in touch with our group. Uh huh. Oh, cool. Forest Lighthouse? No. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. And I've got some catching up to do with Forest uh, Quite possibly beers together in Portland at some point soon. 
Um, so I'll contact him again. Um, I had posted this article in the food systems chat, which was um, like the critique of Bittman's new book. And it was interesting because I thought, it, I thought it, it explored the space between big food, industrial farming and small farms very nicely. Uh, and the, part of the critique of Bittman's work was that um, there's sort of this idea like everybody will go to a small farm, small farms will make it work. And, and uh, there wasn't, uh, and I'm paraphrasing badly here because I'm remembering it badly, uh, but, but it said that there's really interesting sort of strategies uh, at, the, at the medium and large scale to, sh to actually make big shifts. Um, and I'm wondering if that factors in someplace, you know a lot more about the, the systems than I do, but I really liked uh, that piece. Um, so just thought I'd put it back in the conversation. Um, Pete. Uh, two quick things that feel kind of related to weaving the world. Um, one of them is uh, Rob asked an interesting question, I think in the OGM calls channel. Um, he's like, so I don't go to the calls. What's going on with y'all? How do I find out? Um, and uh, Jerry and I both answered. Uh, I had an answer that was basically, <laughs> wander around and ask people otherwise there's not a, a central place to, to look you can look at trove and trove has got um, a lot of the big tent poles or the big masks uh, that you would see in the flotilla but it, it doesn't capture the the news of the day kind of and so then i made a joke about wandering minstrels uh and and jerry replied in kind i woke up this morning i i it was half a joke and half not uh when i posted it yesterday and then this morning it's like yeah it actually i mean it it was it was meant to be fun and light and also um there's a lot of kind of qualitative stuff that you wouldn't capture in a dashboard that you know each of us each of the i i can tell this group um each of you know um, a chunk of what's going on from in OGM that would never get represented in a dashboard, right? Um, the way Wendy M is, you know, doing stuff with Jerry and me, or the way uh, Wendy E is doing stuff with me and Mark Carranza, or, you know, it's just, there's, there are big projects, but then there's gossip in a good way um, that uh, I, I wonder if Weaving the World is going to pick up some of that, you know, um, uh, kind of interesting, uh, below the fold kind of news news of the network. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the other thing uh, is that um, uh, Jerry and the crew yesterday on the Build OGM call, um, I, I ended up bumping, or I was, maybe it wasn't that call, maybe it was another call. Um, but anyway, I was poking around in, in YouTube. Um, I've gotten uh, a, a little bit conversant with uh, the, U the YouTube lingo kind of, or YouTube culture in a really small corner. Um, I watch music video, uh, uh, musicians talking about uh, music um, on YouTube. Um, and so uh, they use some of the, the idioms that you find other places in YouTube, um, the way they edit, uh, the the language they use, um, the different styles of videos uh, that they produce. Uh, some are some are for performances. Some are um, reaction videos. Some of them are um, mashups of a couple different channels together. Um, uh, and um, there's I uh, and, and another really cool thing. <clears throat> um, people that don't even know each other will start to, to refer to, oh yeah, I'm watching this person over here um, and you know they're doing some wonderful stuff or something like that. They, they actually, a, a set of people in the same kind of general um, realm will start to knit together um, pieces of things. Um, they'll, uh, there was a, a really fun one where um, one of the people that does a lot of music analysis did kind of a takeoff. Uh, I think they, they they did like 30 seconds of everybody else doing the same kind of thing and they did it um in kind of an you know they did an impression of that person doing it and it was it was really funny and spot on and it also tied together um all of those folks in this larger conversation that's happening on top of youtube videos um some of it is a little too dear uh jack conti actually is uh part of some awesome projects on youtube he's been doing youtube forever and um uh he's doing awesome projects one of his latest ones they 
the production style is is over the top. It's it looks like clickbait um, if you're not what, paying attention. I guess now that I think about it, there's another guy, um, a supremely awesome bass player, and and about twenty percent of his shtick is completely shtick. It's this camp. Uh, he's kind of got a, a character he lays on top of his awesome performances and awesome stuff. I, some of that is a little bit over the top for me and I could do without it. But on the other hand, I don't know, I, I can also kind of plow through that and get to the meat of it. Um, there's some amazing kind of creators, uh, thinkers, uh, performers doing stuff collaboratively in the round kind of um, on YouTube that I didn't really think of that way until Jerry started talking about weaving the world and I started thinking about what would the weaving the world podcast uh, video podcast be and is there a larger space for more of those similar things interacting together and you, you end up having to pick up some of the some of the YouTube culture YouTube lingo um, to to do that effectively I think so. Thanks Pete and that took us into a really generative space imagining things we might do in weaving the web that would be different from a standard video podcast which is just a bunch of episodes posted separately um and in, you know so that conversation included like a mystery science theater 2000 kind of version where uh, currently weaving the web would probably have normal episodes and then post-processing sort of weave uh, feeding the fungus episodes and then there could be meta there could be like commentary on uh, any any person could do a commentary on any of the above and then feed that into the stream, and we could build links of, of those uh, of those commentaries connected up uh, to the, the episodes. And at some point, it, it like explodes. Uh, you know, if, if if participation goes crazy, like there's too much for anybody to watch. But if we find ways to get the insights from all the different uh, participants back sort of into the the main flow, then it gets really generative and fun. And uh, and I think we need we need the energy that Pete's describing of different creative people, different talented people taking a look at these issues and and taking a swing at them. So that was really cool. Thanks, Pete. Um, um, and do you mind forwarding to me the download link for the call? Yes, uh, yeah. Already done. Um, oh, only minutes good. ago, but I didn't see it. Shit. Okay. Well, thanks. you've been uh, you've been moderating. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect, um, Mr. Grossman. I'm coming in late, so I don't know if, uh, if Pete touched on this um, earlier, but um, kind of continuing in that thought, uh, I mean, certainly people know that, that uh, TikTok is really a hotbed of, of weaving and, you know, duetting and, um, and duetting I don't know what you would call it, triading, quadretting. There's, there's, um, there are, there are videos that, that are layered and layered and layered where you have um, people adding harmonies to um, musical bits, people um, doing reaction shots, people having conversations in a sort of asynchronous chain. Um, and one thing that strikes me as, as he talks about that and thinking about the idea of, of weaving the world and weaving the web is that as a practice, I, you know, the, the practice that exists elsewhere is basically, um, you know, a, pr a pretty spontaneous and, and unorganized um, I'm going to add myself to this existing mix or just this one existing person or this thing that's happening. Um, and the idea that, that weaving the world as a participatory, participatory exercise would involve not just um, adding yourself to, to something that is some, some content that is, has been generated, um, but pulling something together with that. In other words, um, you, you know, the, the, the practice, the rules of the game might be that like your, your duty is to connect, um, connect a different thread that might not otherwise be seen as connected with a, a thing that you've observed. 
um, like two people who don't know about each other but should, um, uh, things that are musically re related but that relate relationship hasn't been highlighted by anybody. Um, so it's almost like a reverse pyramid scheme, like the more it goes on, <laughs> the the more one it becomes instead of splitting I don't, the pyramid scheme analogy it's not quite right because it's it is pyramidic um anyway just wanted to throw out that thought and and urge people to to uh i don't know who here is on TikTok, but it's a really interesting pulse and really dynamic um place to see a lot of different things going on and it's not you know it's not all lim lips lip syncing and, and dance moves and there's some really brilliant stuff happening there. It's, it's, it's like watching early filmmaking, um, except that it's hyper collaborative and, and clever and, and stuff like that. There's, they're in like people, it's, it's amazing what, how creative people can be and, and how engaging and how collaborative, like stuff like just explodes. And all of a sudden there are 20 people who don't know each other. They don't know where they are in the world even. And they're doing this essentially this video jam, you know, and it and video is not quite the right the right thing. It's like performance in the round, right? Um, so like take the the best uh, improv theater. It it's better than that, you know. It's it's freaking amazing and super fun to watch. And and it's emergent too. It's the part of the fun of it is you've got so many participants that you can get these emergent phenomena that happen that aren't because there's a troop of improv players who've been doing it for for 10 years together it's like magic that happened in the web because of the web because of a video because of a duetting it's amazing there's the new york times has a tech columnist who does online culture and she's really really good i'm totally spacing on her name right now she does longer pieces that have lots of visuals shira um, it's, it's not emily badger would you say what was her first name shira um that sounds right. right. I'll, I'll get her name, but I'll look her up too. Here. I kind of want to yeah. find her take or someone else's take on the phenomena that, that you just described, uh, or, or any anybody's like like lots of clips and and how the play, how the interplay works and all of that. Um, I mean, I will say it's it's like emergent from the capability of the tool set, and that you know this was not by TikTok's design. That this happened. This is, you know, a really great and and easy to access tool set that um, participants educate each other on ways to use or to bring in third party things. You know, here's how I, I mean, just like in the music sphere, somebody, uh, Pete, that thing you posted where somebody was breaking down Billie Eilish's um, Ocean Eyes. Um, and and the tracks and um, this this was in the meta music um, uh, CSC Mattermost um, and that that a lot of there are a lot of um, videos on YouTube explaining how to make both videos on YouTube and do other things. I mean, it's a good place for the how tos that people have gone to YouTube for. But they would that would be unmakeable without the tool set that um, that TikTok has has made much much easier than YouTube ever did. I mean, YouTube just like you make it however you make it, you put it up here, but we're not helping. Um, so I, I do think that that's I mean, that's something that I think about in terms of work I'm doing is like how it it takes um, really ace tool creation and, and technical knowledge to make things simple. And that, uh, yeah, I mean, how, how it, to do they that? Kind of, they kind of accidentally in, invent, like, tick, you know, TikTok was like, oh, it would be cool if you had a talking head and then somebody else could talk, you know, against it. Or it'd be really cool if somebody could sing one part of a song and then somebody else would do a harmony or something like that. But, but then you can take that, the, the the duet and then you can duet that right so all of a sudden you've got this like mix in time kind of thing that, that happens and then the the really amazing thing is that given this little sliver of creative um uh potential kind of 
there are people accidentally in the world who can pick that up and do this amazing thing and then they can keep the chain going it's just crazy and it's crazy it's this demonstration of how how creative like you give humans just a little bit of um, the ability to be playful and creative and bam you get people just doing it it's like freaking amazing i i've got one of the one of the small stories this isn't one of the big ones but one of the small stories um uh, a woman is kind of like humming to herself she says i think this is a bop she's and so she's in her car literally in her car um like with her phone and she's singing this little like hesitant kind of you know and and somebody picked it up and duetted it and he was a real uh, a, a real amateur music producer so he was like okay well so we need a drum track we need a little vibes we need to like and he just magic magic it up and he he cut together all the stuff that he did that probably took an hour or two to do into like 20 seconds of like let's take this thing and amp it up and she's like oh my god this is so cool so literally after the course of like like six or eight back and forth they did uh they did a, a real version of it they they amped it all up it's this super well-produced song that i went and like favored it on spotify because you know it got big enough that it's like on spotify now it's really amazing and that's a small one that was uh, like only two people jamming jamming the heck out of it love that um I'm adding a couple things. Amanda Hess is the reporter, and she's really, really good at what she does. Like her, her pieces are are really incisive, and she's been online a very long time. knows the means, knows the the forces, but has a really good way of of expressing them. Um, and so I'm I'm kind of I'm bubbling up a question, which is how can weaving the world um, pick up some of the mojo from uh, duetting, remix culture, et cetera, et cetera? How can we make this also fun? Uh, and co-creative in the ways we've been just talking about right now, which is a lovely, a lovely thing to fold into our conversations. Uh, oh, Shara, yeah. Very interesting. And then a whole bunch of reporters have gone off and become Substack reporters, basically, you know, uh, done the done Charlie Wurzel, a bunch of others. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting. It's a, it's a, it's a, an interesting moment because I'll just ask a rhetorical question that maybe isn't, which is, how can we encourage and frame and maybe model some of these people stepping into weaving the world as artists who are making a living because the weaving that they do and the piece that they play and actually making sense of the world uh, is popular and lots of people subscribe. So sh should weaving the world have a Substack blog that's paid and then we all, whoever, whoever contributes posts to our shared Substack um, shares the revenues, I don't know. It's it's a it's a, that would be very simple to set up uh, and experiment with. Um, I want to pipe up just to um, to note and and caution us. You know, having having been in that spot, like continuously <laughs> in trying to to make a a, a business a thing um, that. Our, you know, our super smart, you know, awareness of like this cool thing and that cool thing and this cool thing. And wouldn't it be cool if like all these things to get to, to be together are, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of hubris there and, and everything that we add <laughs> to our thinking um, makes it less likely that it's going to happen and, and like, Figuring out how to how to not be so omni ambitious and you know find our lane and you know get in it and do that really well. Um, I, I we you have to engineer for for serendipity, which if you engineer that? serendipity, it won't happen, right? Um, so you, you you need serendipity and playfulness and fun, and then. And then hopefully other people will pick up on and, and jam with you. So you can't make it happen. You can actually each of the each of the people I think about and now uh, they, they've got a lot of playfulness and a lot of inventiveness and a lot of production actually. Um, uh, they they they're they're making very clean um, 
clean productions. Even the guy who does silly stuff, um, uh, it's is very well done. So, um, so, so when everybody's doing this high production stuff and everybody's being playful, you get these, you end up getting these bubbling cross connections. Also, I'm kind of importing some things from the spirit. I'd, I'd love for our work to be more like Morris dancing and less like coal mining. Yep. <clears throat> and so if we can, and then if, if we can invite other people to riff and do things without us necessarily going and building them, and then when they send in the link, we can shine the light on them and, and go deeper and talk about it. Uh, you know, let's just, let's just leave the door open for interesting things to show up, I think. But, but Michael, you're pointing to a, a general tendency also that I, I know I have, which is like, let's, let's try to eat the world. Um, and uh, that, that's really hard to digest. Stacey? Yeah, just as an aside, like the um, example that Pete used of that really good musical person who just added on to the other woman. You can do that when things are playful, but what, what I see happening when it comes to like there's business involved, people are less um, likely to want to add something of their own and people are also less likely to want to receive something because it's their baby. <laughs> So I think that's something that we really need to always think about because it's always underneath. That's it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other thoughts on this creative stretch and cautions? Equally welcome. Um, good. So why don't I, for a moment, share... Uh, blah, 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 blah share the doc and then what I'll, uh, I'll ask you all. So this is a Google doc. So far, I haven't created it as an open link. I've just been inviting individuals in. Uh, shall I just invite us all in individually or shall I, um, shall I do the create a link that anybody with the link can, can, can basically come in and edit or comment? Uh, anybody um, with the link. So let's do this one. And uh, all right, let's post that to the chat. Oops, I'm in screen share, so I don't see my chat easily. There we go. And then I'll go back to screen share and uh, go back to Did document. you set that to edit or? I don't know. I guess it, it looks like edit there. Does it? OK. No it says uh, request access. So. I think I need to change the setting, but I figured uh, it didn't give me the option to change the, just this copy link. It doesn't. Uh, Actually, let me step, change the preferences. So I will, I will go now, and it's going to it's going to open the document again with the dialog. So um, you want to click. There's a, another thing you want to click there. Okay. Any, anyone with the link? Yeah, I didn't see that. That's my usual plan, but I'll we'll find it. Um, so I also wanted to go through this. Now my computer is going to, I think, bring up the. I, I think permission. you might need to do it now. I don't think people can open it. It's not coming. Okay. I was waiting for this document to open the permissions dialog because I was, I had clicked on the notice that said give Hank permission. So I was expecting it to slowly bring up the dialog, which is now happening. Do, 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 do. Computer now doing too many things at once. Officially. Yeah, there's Michael. Can I ask a question while we're waiting? Yes, please. This is my uh, first uh, weaving the world um, uh, gathering as opposed to a um, commons gathering. And I'm just curious about the relationship between the two and whether weaving the world is in the commons or <laughs> weaving the world is a totally, you know, other thing that's, OGM proprietary, or it gets in that existential. That's stuff. totally fine. Uh, so this is um, uh, as open as we can make it. So these I, calls- I, I just filled openly. it. Oh, you did it? Yeah. OK, great, thanks. I was wondering why it had changed. Although That's you great. might want to say editor there, right? Ex That's what I was going to change, exactly. So copy link, done. And now let me repost that to the chat, just in case. Here's an updated link. Didn't change anything. It's just the permissions that changed. Okay. Um, 
let me go back to share screen and just talk through the document for a sec. Um, so there's a bunch of sort of digital assets that exist already. There's uh, two websites, Weaving the World and TheBigFungus.both.orgs, uh, both of which are, are, I own are in my account. So at some point, those probably need to be moved into a commons account. But for right now, we're starting there. And I set up simple baby sites on Google Sites, which are really, really simple for collaboration. Anybody who wants to, I can add as an, ad, as an admin or editor on either of those sites. Uh, and I think that, you know, on the Weaving the World site, we're going to need uh, pages for each of the episodes, a bunch of stuff that a normal podcast would have, but there's, you know, that's a little bit down the road. Pete and I created a new account on uh, Gmail called OGM Forge, <clears throat> which is kind of the, uh, I, need, I need to shift from posting all of the episodes through my account over into a different account. So that's what this is. And I think that a lot of these assets will probably move over, move over there. Uh, also created a Google Drive folder for uh, digital assets. If we build a logo for this, it should go in that folder in a, in a subfolder called assets, that kind of thing. Uh, we have three Mattermost channels, one called Weaving the World, which is really intended for public discussions. It's really about when we start the show, we'll tell people, hey, come chat over here. This is the place where we'd like to have an ongoing conversation. <clears throat> Ops is for this conversation and designing uh, weaving the world and all, you know, designing the fungus and all those kinds of things. <clears throat> and then uh, there's a Mattermost channel for the big fungus to figure out how do we talk about this thing? What, what are the commons implications? Uh, other kinds of topics. I think, I think that'll be an emergent conversation. Uh, we've got several GitHub repos uh, that have just been organically coming up around OGM. I've done nothing special to create a new repo for weaving the world, but we probably uh, should and will. Um, we're, we've got a light conversation going with the Internet Archive, and I think that uh, donating our assets to the Archive early would be a, an interesting piece of workflow to do. Uh, and then I created a very simple schedule spreadsheet that looks like this, uh, that Wendy Elford went and posted uh, uh, an offer into. So ignore this episode one, I'll, I'll delete that. But, but the idea here is that we'll have candidates basically listed uh, someplace, and I just started with a spreadsheet. <clears throat> candidates for uh, episodes of Weaving the World. And then we'll talk about them here and then sort of put them up into a schedule uh, and then start enumerating them. And then uh, as we post them online, add links to them and other kinds of data that we need uh, in the spreadsheet here. But this, this is just an ancillary piece. And it's really simple on Google Sites, for example, uh, absolutely trivial to embed that spreadsheet on a page on, uh, on a Google Site. So once that thing turns into a, a reasonable looking schedule that might provoke other people to send in ideas, I don't, and I, I'm quite sure I don't want that spreadsheet openly editable by anybody in the world, that spreadsheets that do that go down the tubes. Uh, but I'm very interested in soliciting uh, suggestions and figuring out you know, uh, how, to, how to bubble up that schedule. Um, uh, one of the goals of this first couple months effort on Weaving the World, I think is to create an explainer video uh, which says, hey, here's what this project is. This is why this is not your average video podcast. Uh, here's what we're doing underground metaphorically and, and how these things fit together. So I started a, a, another Google Doc as a baby script. And I think there's going to be a, a bunch of different Google Docs that spin out of this, uh, like you know, intros and outros for the, the various assets. Uh, under here, this stretch here is all the common stuff about, uh, about leaving the world. And I'll come back to it. Uh, but then I did a little bit about staff and how we collaborate and then uh, and budget and episodes. But then there's two sections toward the end about producing the video podcast and producing the audio podcast specifically. So, so the stuff down here is only whatever is uh, different for video and audio. And I, I had a really nice conversation with Jim Rutt's producer, uh, Jared James, I think his name is. I'm, I'm just remembering it wrong off the, off the cuff, but uh, he's delightful and he's going to sort of write a proposal back about what they might do because Jim offered some of his production capacity, but I don't know to what level and a piece of the budget that he's granting to us uh, to build this stuff goes into production uh, budget. So there, there's money actually uh, for somebody to do video and audio uh, production of different kinds. And for example, uh, Jim Rutt has two different uh, levels of audio of podcast for his show, which is the Jim Rutt Show. There's the Jim Rutt Show, which, which is like high production value, edited with care, uh, and apparently six, seven, eight hours worth of editing for every episode, like a lot of work to do. Uh, and then there's a second one called something like Conversations, 
which is meant to be less formal, less edited. Uh, so intentionally like that. And I think, I think we're aiming for a production value that's not, uh, certainly out of the gates, we're not aiming for shiny and polished. Uh, we're aiming for real, authentic, and like productive and useful. So, um, but there's interesting th things here. And I think that, that uh, one just one interesting thing to think about is given YouTube's affordances, because you can mark chapter headings in a video, you can do a whole bunch of interesting kind of metadata to YouTube. Um, how much of that should we do? How much of that can we automate? Uh, what would that look like? And how does, how does that make our, the videos that we post more useful uh, in general? So that's a conversation to have down the road. Um, but this created new new YouTube account for it is the is the the new Gmail account that I described that Pete and I started, um, and then there's um, a question that uh, and Pete maybe this just is just you and I sitting together. But if anybody else is interested, like um, I get uh, I get an email from Zoom. Many of you do too. Whenever you record a call, I get an email from the Zoom that says, "Hey, your recording is ready for downloading," because I almost never download directly to my computer. Uh, what to do with that recording and how much of that can be automated so that some of the editing, posting, clipping can, can, can be done sort of uh, quickly uh, and automatically instead of manually, because right now I do it all manually. Uh, and then for audio, um, I, I looked at anchor.fm when it was uh, just a baby and they've, they, it's a podcasting platform that's kind of soup to nuts. It, it lets you it lets you actually run calls while using Anchor, including throwing in sound effects, including calling a guest and having the guest join you. Uh, the, the newest version of Anchor on an iPad is actually quite an awesome thing. You can also use Anchor when you have a recording from somewhere else, as, as we will, because one of the files that we'll get from Zoom is, a, is an audio file uh, that we can just drop into Anchor uh, once we, and then maybe add an intro and an outro to that, and then just post it. And, the idea here is to have the intro of the of the audio only version say, "Hey, you're listening to something that's actually quite visual." And every now and then there'll be a moment that's puzzling to the to you on audio only. But uh, all you know, we'd like to make this available to you when you're driving and walking. So uh, so here you go. And I think just if we can automate the production of an audio po audio only podcast, we greatly expand the people who can reach what we're talking about. And I think also a lot of our conversations are, will be, will be cool, will be fun, will be like, just the conversational parts will be worth listening to. Uh, it may turn out that we need to have somebody pay special care and edit out the very visual parts of the audio podcast. I don't know. Um, I don't, I, I, I think it's not a tremendous amount of extra work to do the audio podcast as well. Uh, but I do know that setting it up at the very beginning uh, is going to be a little extra work with, in particular, we need to have some kind of uh, icon, some kind of, you know, uh, visuals for how these things work uh, so that it looks like a podcast when it shows up uh, at the other end uh, when people are looking for what podcast to listen to. But I think that's, that's kind of all doable. Um, so that's, that's kind of uh, what I'd put in the document so far. Uh, and again, I think what'll happen is uh, you know, if we wind up with a design Bible, which I don't think we need early on, but but a lot of a lot of entities have like a design Bible that says, here's the font we use, here's our color scheme, here's the general, uh, you know, we use material design or whatever, and uh, here's how we go about it. That could be its own separate sub project. And, and part of what I'm trying to figure out is how to crowdsource a lot of this stuff among OGM uh, to figure out who would like to pick up a piece and do something. Uh, for example, I am clearly not an expert on uh, end screens on YouTube. I've made them, I've used a couple. I don't typically add them to our, to our uh, OGM calls. I, don't, I haven't created a lovely end screen that I like that I can just pick up because YouTube Studio is pretty good about, hey, here's the end screens you have in your kind of gallery. Um, but I haven't, I haven't done one. So none of our uh, videos going up has an end screen that says, come join OGM, do whatever else. I would love for somebody who understands that really deeply and just can do it quickly uh, to just sit down and do that. <clears throat> Hank is writing, who is the audience, which is a great question. And kind of what I'd love to do next is stop my screen share, uh, read what you all have put in the chat, and then see which of these questions you'd like to dive into. Uh, yes, I have a folder. Uh, Bentley, I have a folder and I can give everybody permissions to the folder. Uh, one question I have that I guess I didn't put in uh, in that list 
and because now it's feeling sort of like old tech is usually when I do things like I, I haven't done anything as big as this, as broad as this, but I often start up a Google group and I use the Google group as an access control list. And what I do then is I give the Google group access to the folder or the docs. And then I just add and subtract people from the Google group and it kind of acts as, as a kind of uh, overall access control list for, for different Google properties. And it does so pretty elegantly. Um, uh, or I can go just add people to the folder directly, but then, but then I wind up having to control folder access somehow carefully. So anyway, open to, to cleverer solutions. So I, I think as long as you just have one top folder, yeah, you don't have to manage anything below that. I think it's easier than to manage that folder than the Google group. Yes, but I'm afraid of making that folder completely open to the world. I, I would love a little bit of like- so just do yeah. access control on that folder. Yeah, what I what I what I've done in that case is I is I have a main folder that has access control, and then beneath that I have one that's called public that I have yep. open to everyone, and then we we can control what we want just by moving it into the correct folder. Well, that's good. I like that. Um, let me let me get to my the folder I created, and we can just stare at the permissions and see what what that. No, no, no. In general, what I like is having everything commentable by the public. So yeah. I don't know that they really need to edit um, I've, I've done something very similar with bentley's thing but for clarity um, we had a shared folder and then one public and one private so it was really obvious that the, that helps that the private stuff was private gotcha so here's weaving the world folder um you know people when we talk security they really should have a separate link for Anyone with this link can edit and a separate link for anyone with this. Yeah. So shall I go to read only? Sh shall I go to share here? Is that am I in the uh, right yeah. am mm -hmm. I in the right place to set permissions for the for the overall folder? And then what yep. I'll do is I'll create a public and private folder and move things into those right here. That's a good idea. Um, and maybe we also need to take a, a funding for you to get a faster laptop there, Trey. One of my goals is to get an M1 laptop. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the the other it's not just the CPU. The other thing is memory. Um, yeah, I, I want to get like a, a, get, a mega a mega tera. I want to yeah. get a petabyte of memory. How about that? Yeah, that might be enough. Um, okay, so anyone with the link for the so here's the deal. Do we want commenter at this level or what? Uh, at the top level, top level, you probably don't want to give. You probably want to cancel all of that and just run it by security oh sorry uh, don't know what you mean share because because we need to share this folder so people can actually well, instead of anyone with the it. link uh well the, the top level folder oh. i think you actually share with the it's essentially admins you share that with and then the public one you share with everybody and then the private one you share with who with all the all the participants gotcha. i guess the challenging thing about that is that when people have when they're searching for that in the share folders, if it's just labeled public, it'll just be public. So you may have to call it yeah, WPW public. Um, I, I was working with Anne and, and CFS on this and and the name the name was really clumsy. It's clumsy. It was public CFS, you know, shared files or something like that and private right. you know, CFS only or something. Hmm. So here, shall I add a couple of you as admins? Uh, yeah. yeah. Because I'm in the high level, and I think I agree with what you just said. Yeah, if so, you want Pete and me Pete to help you out, I volunteer Pete with me. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Bentley. <laughs> and Bentley, your Gmail address? Uh, yeah, that's the best one. Yeah, yeah. good. Oh, and wow, that's an old photo of me that popped up there. See, this is what you look like in other people. And Pete, I'll use your Gmail address as well. Yeah. Cool. Anybody else want to be an admin on this folder? Speak up. Yeah, I can always add you later. This is a good moment. I think I saw Michael go raise his hand. Uh, Michael, I can't see you. I'm not actually um, looking. Do you, would you like that? Oh, we can't hear you either. Uh, yeah, exactly. But... Let me. Uh... Sorry, I was uh, on a different screen. There we go. And I've only got your factor address. Do you have a Gmail address? Uh, that's my, I do, but the, I'm, I'm generally it in works. that mode. Um, That's so fine. Too. Cool. I'd All like right. to be added. Sounds great. Jerry, can you add me too? I have you right here. Great. Thank you. Brilliant. 
Okay. Well, in that case, let, let me join as well. Okay. <laughs> I'm not well, sure what it body. means, but uh, I'm go certainly back. committed to helping with this. Brilliant. Uh, I do have a Gmail address. If you why don't we use your Gmail address, I think, instead? What is it? Uh, Kuhn47. Yeah, there it is. Oh, Kuhn47 at Gmail. Let's use that one. How about that? Terrific. Cool. And then um, I will create uh, two new folders in here, public and private. Is that right? Uh, actually, make them fancier. Um, let me hit return on, on a Zoom chat thing, something okay. like this. Uh, you you want to include the name of the org, so WTW instead of CFS. Right, right. And then for the public one, you, you kind of need all of that. It's shared. Yep. <laughs> it's a folder. It's publicly visible. Gotcha. Um, so that it's really clear. So that it's really clear. Gotcha. Okay, so new folder. And the reason for that is people just see that name in their in their G drive, and if right. you don't have all of that stuff in there, it's it's completely opaque what it is. Like so for I that forgot. one, you might want to spell out leaving the world. You're saying right? good point. Uh, leaving the world private files, just private. I would just do private, but all right. Because everybody knows there's files in here. And we can move all those in and then uh, leaving the world public. Uh, visible to all. Um, I like the way I wrote it. Um, what did you I, say? I think shared is important and I think publicly visible is important. Uh, so should I say, sh sorry, leaving the world shared and then publicly visible? Um, uh, the way I wrote it is shared folder dash publicly visible. Got it. Um, the reason for publicly visible instead of public is public is, is opaque. It's not, you don't know what that means. Right. Um, and then, uh, the shared folder part is more descriptive of, of what this is. Okay. And how much, so part of this is about who gets to come in and edit stuff, which is the reason we're creating two different folders. But if we're going to be building this in public view, we mostly want this stuff in the public folder, right? Yeah. Or wrong. Like what? I mean, what I, kind of what kind of stuff will we want to put in the private folder? Um, uh, a budget spreadsheet. Draft, well, budgets budget should probably be publicly visible too, right? Yeah. The where we where we got to with the the, the OGM steward stuff is um, uh, the the main stuff you want to have private is something that in in. Uh, has has personal information about somebody or right. somebody. Um, the other thing is draft stuff or you know op stuff that that doesn't make sense to you know I I, I guess meta stuff. Yeah. So right this minute, I'm going to drag all these things into the public folder, the shared folder. Does that make sense? I see. I I don't um, see anything I've got going so far. So let's let's think through the the private and public folders a little bit more. Thanks. Um. Uh. For weaving the world participants, you want them to have right access. Um, and for everybody else, you you want view but not right. Exactly. So Peter, I guess if you have you, admin. Do you? Maybe you and I should do that since we're more familiar. Okay. Rather than making Jerry. Yeah, I'm, happy, I'm happy to learn this and do it in front of all of us because some of us don't know what, how this works and I think we can all learn. So, um, and I'm just realizing we're getting the, near the top of our hour. Um, I'm, so I'm actually, if we want um, another, I, I wonder if we want two public ones. One that's public read write maybe, and then another one which. Yeah, so the right. so the publicly visible folder could contain a a bin that's that's completely open to everybody. Anybody can, where everybody can drop files in, do whatever, uh, as I think Bentley was just describing. And then the other folder can have a closer in permissioning, I guess. I, I think the way to do it is publicly visible um, has uh, the sharing setting is anyone can view, and then you 
add people in uh, with right access individually. I think that's the way you end up working. So we end up actually working an access control list at the folder level in Google Drive. Yeah. Okay. And that sounds fine. Well, let's let, let me postpone that because I wanted to spend the end of our call just sort of talking about priorities. Um, one important question I've got is when should the first episode be and who should the guests be? That's like really important at this point. Um, I was in a great conversation yesterday, which was part of the mapathon that Kiala was kind of holding uh, that included Gio, Mila, uh, and Amber, uh, whose last names I can produce on request but are not in my head right now. Um, but oh, the end of, pardon? Galdalin or something like that. Something like that. Yeah. Um, but um, we had a really delightful conversation uh, that was kind of generally speaking toward diversity and 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 uh, all those kinds of things. But but it was the kind of conversation I'd like to have early in uh, in feeding uh, in weaving the the world. Um, and so I'm I'm gonna you know offer them a brainstorming call to to figure out what that is, what shape does it have, uh, and I don't think that every so I don't think every episode of Weaving the World needs to have celebrities in it. I don't think this is a tour of celebrities. I think this is a tour of people who are trying to figure out how to, how to improve the world in different ways. Um, and in some cases, we'll have five guests who are collaborating. In some cases, we'll have one guest who's a spotlight, whatever. And then, and then another design question that's important to me is, uh, I think the pattern is that there is an episode, which is an official episode, and then there's some post-processing, which turns into one or more other calls that are connected to this episode that are trying to weave uh, what was discovered there and what we, you know, what, what we think of it uh, into mine and other, uh, uh, over time, multiple points of view on all this and, we, and connecting those things. Um, are those all in the same stream of the same podcast, which is my default setting now? Or is the underground work, so to speak, a separate podcast and a separate behind the curtain kind of thing? Um, and one of the things that Jim's producer said is that uh, when you post podcasts these days, there's a lot of metadata you can put in. So you can one of the fields you can mark in is that this is a bonus episode and this is a regular episode, for example. So we could maybe just use some metadata in the podcast streams to say, hey, this is a, a, a capital E episode. This is a... Uh, post-production behind the behind the curtain kind of thing. I don't know. But um, those are working questions that I'd like to get a, a good starting point on uh, as we set this thing down. Uh, so. I, I, I think um, uh, if, if I were a viewer, I guess, if I were a viewer, I'd want to see the, the live episodes kind of. And then I would want to see all those in one stream and then be able to also access the behind the scenes ones in another stream. So it's kind of like they want to be in the same channel, but maybe different playlists. I guess the same channel, different playlists. Is the so a cheap, a, a cheap, exactly. A cheap trick I, I would do with that is uh, just set separate playlists. And I kind of do that with the build OGM calls. So I have two different, I have a playlist called Open Global Mind and every, every OGM call except for the free jury's brain calls, I add to Open Global Mind. For the build OGM calls on Tuesdays, I think I have a second playlist called Build OGM and I just add it to that. So then I can send people a link to just the build OGM thread or, or the larger thread. I guess what I don't have is uh, I don't have, that's interesting, I don't have the thin down list if you only wanted to watch the Thursday calls, the check-in calls. I don't have a playlist for that, but that would be very easy to set up. But that, that has not been my habit. So the, on YouTube, the, it's pretty normal for channels to have a second channel, and that's where they put the uh -huh. secondary content. Yes. And the reason you don't use lists in that way is that people can't subscribe to one or the other if they're in the same channel. Yeah. Sounds great. So, yeah, so like setting up different channels. Yeah. So channels would be much better. Yeah. Okay. You have, so we have, to have you set a theme, Jerry? Sort of a, an overall sort of an umbrella that uh, would then allow you to to link those channels uh, into a common theme. Well, I think the theme is finding people who got solutions to to move the move you know move civilization forward, which could go everywhere from. Uh, mixing art and technology and spirituality in a ritual all the way over to 
Um, what is the next technical stack for businesses? Like, like you know, uh, we could have an interesting discussion trying to compare co-makery with disco co-op with steward ownership with DAOs. That would make a like that would probably make several interesting calls, um, and then process all that and filter all that into the shared artifact. So the theme is distilling um, really interesting stuff from lots of different people. And Wendy Elford made the point that if this is weaving the world, it needs to be people from around the world. Uh, so not just focus on, on, uh, on Americans, on Americans, um, which, uh, which sounds she great also, as well. Um, she also thought it was really important to start with somebody um, from the world rather than from America. Right. Um, and if I do, if we talk with Joe and Mila and, uh, 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 and Amber, for example, I think that's a really lovely international uh, kind of kind of call right there. I mean, that's a, that's a I think that that hits that note beautifully. Um, so so Klaus, I think the theme, and, and and I'm posing this back to you as if this is not satisfying, but the theme is that we're trying to weave together people's ideas that are trying to fix the world. So we're weaving the world kind of, and I'm just thinking this throughout right now, but uh, one of the interesting things about weaving and basket making is that you can repair woven artifacts by weaving into the fabric. You can, you know, reconnect, uh, uh, you know, in, in the old days, you didn't throw away the wicker chair when it died, you actually like went back in and fixed the wicker uh, kind of thing. So, so I think that the weaving here is, is also, collaboratively making a, a better artifact with other people. There's, there's that whole theme. I haven't, I, I clearly haven't found the crisp, clear language for it, but uh, those are the metaphors that I'm working with. Yeah, I, I think it would be helpful to create uh, a logo of some sort um, that, that and, and, and create you know, a headline and a subline uh, that really concentrates what you're trying to express. Agreed, uh, totally agree. Uh, open for candidates, and we'll uh, we'll elaborate that in the planning doc. That's a that's a great thing. Other thoughts at this point? Where about where we are? Uh, borrow something from um, borrow something from streaming TV, um, uh, and call this season one. I was going to use a numbering scheme of s uh, s num numerals e numerals. Does that make sense? Like yeah, season I, I episode? That's, season that's one, episode form. one? I, I, I think you also need to say season. Um, or if if you were British, it would be series. But um, but I think you have to expand the S sometimes. Yeah. Um, I, the shorthand, if it's in a title of an episode or something like that, would be, I think, the, the, the shorthand. The, 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 reason that, that, the reason that comes up for me is um, uh, if, if I were doing this, thankfully I'm not, uh, thankfully it's you. Um, if I were doing this, uh, I would figure the, the first season is is kind of, you know, the, the one where I'm making all the mistakes and, you know. The pilot episodes. The, yeah, so so it's like, okay, I want to kind of cluster those together and, you know, and, and then you can kind of, the, this also goes with your funding phases, I think too, right? Um, in season two, we hope to be talking about blah, 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 or, you know, we have to, we'll, we'll add, a, you know, a producer, you know, credit or whatever, you know, I, you can start setting up um, an, an, a longer narrative, a uh, longer arc of the, the podcast in the series. We could also work with a broader headline, maybe starting out by saying, why do we need to leave the world? You know, focus on on the brokenness of our system, and uh, and and just speak generically, not offering solutions, but speak generically to um, the pathologies that have evolved, you know, in, invariably over the last few decades, and then move into uh, in 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 the next phase into you know, here are some ideas where we could be moving to. So this is exactly why we need the explainer video. This is this is precisely the content that needs to be in the explainer video, and the explainer video needs to be very visible, sort of high in the stack of, of our materials. But that that story of wait, what, what, why are we doing this? What is the context? All of that is hugely important. Um, totally agree. And then a, a last note, which is that um, I think one of the one of the things that that we'll do here is have correspondence, and I think Stacy might end up being uh, weaving the world's first correspondent. Uh, in this, in the sense of Noah, if Trevor Noah has correspondents who do reports from the field and and do different kinds of things, 
and, and Stacy will arrange it in whatever way is comfortable for you. So it could be that I'm you're the- I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure about the way you're framing that. It, good. And, and, and it, could be that you're, it could be that you're the producer of an episode in one of the series uh, and you're behind the curtain, but you've figured out what's the topic, what's the guest. And I'm, and I'm actually facilitating the thing. That could work. But if you wanted to step in and like play, be facilitator and all that, I'm like totally into that. And I'm happy to, to coach you or to whatever level of comfort and participation you want. You. Let's, let's, let's work that. Thank you. I'm really interested in the post-production part. I think there might be a lot of opportunities there. So thank you. I will take you up on that. Cool. And, and I think I need, I need mentally to figure out uh, better how to explain and what is the relationship between weaving the world and the big fungus, because uh, what I have now in my head is that Weaving the World is one of maybe eventually many different shows and other entities that are feeding the big fungus together. And that that the framing of the big fungus is temporary and it's a starting point. And it's our own funny tongue-in-cheek metaphor for the commons, which all of us should be feeding. And, and so I don't care if anybody else calls it the big fungus, but I care that our commons connect in a much more fruitful way than what, what is happening right now. I mean, the good news is that right now there's a whole bunch of GitHub repos and other, other places where you can find code, uh, book writings, other, other sorts of artifacts, that's great. Uh, but, but they're not woven into a shared story or set of stories or, or other kinds of things. So that's kind of the idea for, for the big fungus, but how to explain that well uh, and, and also practically um, what do these, what does this higher level layer of linkages actually look like and mean? And we're, that's what we've been wrestling with in, in Free Jury's Brain and a lot of OGM for the last 19 months now, 18 months now. I don't know, as long as lockdown. If the real gap in, in uh, communications with, with uh, the general public is a lack of systems thinking. I mean, the understanding of systems. So interestingly enough, when I was uh, interviewing with the uh, uh, planetary care group here, they asked me, so what should we call you? Should we call you the Viva? <laughs> Literally, I said, no, I'm just, I'm a strategist, right? So the idea of, of, of strategy really is an understanding of the connections that need to be relationships, right? That need to be pulled in. And just to start out by explaining, you know, how our thinking must advance, you know, toward, uh, to, to, to understand the connection, the moving out of our individual area of expertise, and seeing how we are linking and impacting other areas. I think that's, that's the most important piece really to get, uh, to get more people to move. Uh, Love that, agreed. I was, um, a, a couple times uh, this call, I've thought about uh, Estelle Caswell um, and Box Earworm. Um, this was a, a fairly short series, um, but uh, they, they produced them really well. And, that thinking of this makes me think of I, I can look at this podcast and you know talk a, talk a lot about what I see um, and why it works you know that so it's each each one is around a question and the question is really intriguing and interesting um, uh, Caswell does a great job of, of kind of explaining something um, so like uh, how a recording studio mishap shaped 80s music um, uh, is, is the story of gated reverb um, and how Phil Collins gave, gifted a sound to the, Phil Collins and his producer, uh, gifted um, a, a sound to the world that really changed 80s music. And here's, um, here's, an, here's an episode that I curated into my brain about Coltrane's changes in the circle of tits, which I knew zero about and it's fabulous, fabulous episode. So it, it makes me think that it would be productive uh, um, to start collecting those from, from everybody um, and then having, having the person who collects it and maybe other folks go, this is, this is why this podcast was really interesting to me. And this is, you know, this is what I see that they did. Um, production tricks or the way you, you uh, frame the question or the way you edit and all of that. Um, uh, because as I watch these different folks doing stuff, you know, there's, there's things that, one of, the, one of the interesting things that now only in thinking about all of them together, um, Andrew Wong has a thing where, 
um, he talks really fast. And and by the way, there's another, I'll have to find it and share it. Uh, there was somebody who did, uh, a, a research group did a, a, a video editing robot um, that could emulate different styles of um, video editing. Um, uh, and there's, and I learned a lot just from the way that they built this robot, but uh, you have close shots on a face, you have long shots with two people talking, uh, uh, you, you can have long edits or short edits, and they actually went through, um, here's a cinematic, uh, uh, cinematic edit set of edits around a, a thing. Here's the YouTube style version of it. It's very short and very chopped. Um, but anyway, uh, Andrew Wong uh, does a thing where he's talking and then he high fives the screen. Um, uh, the slap bass guy, I don't even remember his name. I think of him as the slap bass guy. He's, his whole podcast was about slap bass more or less. Um, but he also does a thing. I think he does a slap. So there's a interaction with the screen and the viewer and a hand that is different than, you know, it, it makes it materially different because you're doing that. Um, it, it feels clunky the first time, a couple times you see it, it, it's like, I don't see that on TV. I don't see, you know, some actor high-fiving me on, on, through the screen, but, right. but it also is a connect, connective thing and a demonstration that you've got hands, not just a not just a head. And so thinking through all of that stuff and how they how these folks have put stuff together um, and what was successful and what wasn't um, uh, is a I, I think that will be a useful thing to start to tease out. And as consumers of YouTube videos uh, or TikTok videos or whatever, um, I think if we start to articulate those things to each other, we'll we'll learn more and maybe get better at it. Um, everybody pick a random direction, up, down, left, or right, and then put your finger at the edge of your screen, <clears throat> wherever that is. Everybody pick a random spot, up, up down, left, or right. Uh, and then take your finger to the edge of your screen. So uh, if you're going up, look at yourself in the video. If you're doing up, go down to your finger just about disappears off your square. Yeah, exactly. So Hank, you need to get your finger over to any edge. Point to the edge. Hank, point your finger out from you. <laughs> and then, <laughs> no, it's, you're off camera now. Actually, the I the camera. Bring Crazy. your finger back. <laughs> bring, it camera. back. bring it back, bring it back. Uh, yeah, aim your hand out, outward. Yeah, actually, go to the other edge. Take your hand to the far to your to your right. I think. Yes. Now hold your finger out like this, level, horizontal. Finger horizontal. Good. Pull it back. Raise it. Pull it back. Back to the center. Stop. Now put your finger out I, like this, horizontal. If Hank is not mirror, <laughs> mirroring would help him. <laughs> this is hilarious. Oh yeah, mirroring helps a lot. You're right. Yeah, exactly. You know, mirroring, I, I, it's pretty hard. That, that's why I guess I guessed right or left, and it seemed to work. So uh, all we want is a finger at the edge, any any edge of your rectangle. That's what we're looking for. Actually, and, because he's not mirrored, mirrored top or bottom would probably be easier. Exactly. Yeah, top and bottom work better. Got it. Yes, yes, we've got it. Can anybody take, can anybody take a snapshot of the screen? I've got, I've got my hand here. I can if we all wait for a sec. Cool. Everybody, hold on. Yeah, Hank, hold that top, uh, hold that pose. This. Hold that pose. Say cheese. Everybody say cheese. Cheese. Excellent. I think it took it. So we could do that. And that's like a form of weaving. <laughs> except, <laughs> except, it, except it was harder to do than, than we might have thought. <laughs> and what's interesting is I was thinking to myself, looking at this, oh, you know, um, from on my screen, uh, Stacy and I were the only two people whose fingers were touching, but then I realized it's probably different for all of us. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's yeah. why I said pick a random direction because I knew that there was no, there was really no way to yeah. make it actually work uniformly. But then there's this nice serendipity about it in that, you know, in the snapshot somewhere there's going to be some connections and uh, the rest of us are pointing in a way that we want to weave. Right. This is sort of a gesture of wanting to connect in a way. I don't know. Yeah. Just playing. Yeah. Yeah. That was fun. Thank you. And Pete, Pete, and Pete, I, I got this Pete. shot, but then I think I, I, I might have deleted it accidentally. Oh, oh you need another one? Let's let's do it, one it again. 
Hi, now right, I'm, on, I'm switching directions. Okay, switch directions. Switch directions. And Hank, go up. No, don't do left, right. I'm trying no, to get it your, out of the blur. Hank, Hank, follow my instructions. Put your hand right in front of your nose. <laughs> no, right in front of your nose. Now raise your raise your hand a little bit until your finger goes up more, up more. Stop. Now go to the right of your head. That's your left. Oh, that's your right. Good. That's what. That's good. Hold it right there. That'll do. And then another trick is to look at your camera instead of the screen. Oh yeah. yeah. Look at your, Three, look. two, one. Captured. I think. <laughs> Thanks. Excellent. Cool. <laughs> We miss Bentley. Bentley, do you want to? Um, I actually did take one while you were taking the other one. Oh, good. <laughs> well, so I still have it. Um, we could merge them all together. Sounds great. My hand-eye cool. coordination is terrible, but I did play right field for a uh, softball team in the softball league many years ago. I was going to uh, ask about sports. That's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Move into right field. No, no, no. The other right. No, the other right field. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. 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 Get that. Um, any last thoughts on this call? I have a question. Yeah. yeah um, I wanted to know what what the laws were in terms of um, adding YouTube clip YouTube clips from other videos to one's own. Like, are there like I don't know what the copyright laws are. Sort of quoting other YouTubers and like taking a piece of their video and adding it to yours. Yeah. Um, I, if you if you do that with a with a Taylor Swift video, uh, the no, law no, will no. descend on you sharply. <laughs> no, let's say let's say it's a video posted in another Facebook group, so to speak, or let's say it's I, the same guest that yeah, is I, now I will being. Let, I will let I will let I will let Pete speak to that. Uh, do you mean the whole video or no? No, I mean like. 30 seconds. I think 30 use. Uh, in the US, and I, I know US better than international, international is actually a little different, um, or different countries are different. Um, in the US, you, there's a fair use thing, right? If, if you're showing a little bit of something and you're not like taking the whole thing, it's kind of okay. Um, I, a long time ago, I remember that being kind of six seconds. Um, if, if you were showing you know, a few seconds of something, then it's not a big deal. Um, but that's it's not a rule that's a, that's kind of a guideline um, uh, because uh, if you got somebody lit, really litigious um, if you took six seconds of a, a Disney cartoon for instance Disney might say well I think that six seconds is really uh, you know was really key and you're hurting our revenues and they might be able to convince a judge or a jury of that and then you know the, the guideline doesn't matter um, part of it is is who you're borrowing from part of it is it's it's actually really nice to say hey i i just produced this thing um i want to include five seconds of of you um you know uh is that okay um and if they say no i a lot of it, it a lot of it is guidelines and being polite more than, well, than okay. uh, there aren't hard rules good and also one of the keys oh sorry go ahead michael I was just going to say one of the keys in in internet context is if you're excerpting something with attribution and linkage, you know, if you, if you're saying um, here's you know here's five seconds here here's you know thirty seconds of an interview so and so did with such and such, and you can find the entire thing here with a link. Yeah. nobody minds that you know it's it's a it's a plug for them yeah. um, so also, that 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 really is you know most of most of the best of what you see of excerpting um that isn't referred nobody feels ripped off everybody feels so it's more a question of etiquette though than of legality well i mean legality it's... come in when somebody can say you are trading on my good name you are, I mean, that's, you know, where you need a fair use defense is when somebody's coming after you for um, trading on their, their good name, um, right. benefiting from what, what they've done. And, and it doesn't really have to do with percentages all the time. I mean, or a number of seconds because, you know, percentages come into play. Like if somebody produced a 15 second video that, you know, 
went viral and you use, you know, six seconds of it, that's a much bigger deal than six seconds of something that's an hour long. Um, so, yeah, and the, it's very it's, judgment call. It's kind of an etiquette guidelines thing, but but in reality, what it is is how likely is somebody to see you, um, and how likely are they? How how likely are you to be able to defend yourself? Um, uh, so then there's also kind of a social thing too, uh, uh, like a YouTuber probably isn't going to sue you because it's not worth it, but um, you can get a, a stink reputation if you look like you're ripping off people. Um, if they can get a million people to, to, you know, hue and cry about what you do, then you don't want that. So since we're going to be weaving and remixing a lot, we need good attribution and we need to put links in the, in the descriptions, for example, so that, that's a great thing to keep in mind. Um, second thought is uh, hip hop music and the sampling in hip hop kind of broke the music business a lot because some songs sample like 30 or 40 other songs and there was no way to clear everything and they're sampling like a little piece. And yet at the same time, you know, if, if, I, if Ice Ice Baby's backbeat is found in someone else's song, they will sue the hell out of them. So, so there's a lot of that kind of in the background. And then remix culture totally was a, another, another wave over hip hop uh, sampling culture that just ripped everything up and, and threw it on the wall because in remix culture, you're intentionally ripping on, on lots of other things. And then I heard, I'm not sure, but from Jamaican reggae culture, uh, reggae artists would ship records with a B side. <clears throat> so the A side of, and I think this is for 45 for singles, uh, the A side would be the song with lyrics and the B side would be um, the song with no lyrics so that other artists could lift and quote your music on purpose. It was like a, it was like a courtesy, um, so that within reggae culture, it was considered an honor to have your particular beats or tune uh, included in someone else's. So there was a within one community, there was a culture of, hey, here, uh, I'm making it easier for you for you to to copy me. Um, so. with, real quick with the attribution, um, Michael and Jerry, thanks for thanks for bringing that up. One of the one of the things to watch for with attribution is. It's, uh, it, it's one of the common things that happens is, is people go, oh, well, I give you attribution. Um, uh, it's actually, it, when you're doing an attribution, it's better if you can reach out to the, the original author and tell them what you're doing. Um, and then a lot of times they'll be super, super cooperative, right? It's like, oh, can I also give you this? Can I give you this? Um, if you don't talk to them and you say, well, I gave you attribution, you shouldn't, it, that's, you know, that's not polite. Um, and they can still feel, they, they can still end up feeling ripped off um, because they weren't able to give you, you know, if you weren't interactive with them, if you weren't conversational, they didn't get to say, oh, could you please use this clip instead of that clip because that one's old or something like that, right? You can still hurt somebody's feelings even if you, th even if you give them attribution. You really want to use, attribution is Social the artifact. end result of a conversation rather than a preemption of a conversation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, that's really well put. Um, awesome, well, this has been really useful, helpful, generative. You all have access to the docs now. Uh, so um, LM, let's talk on WTW ops between calls. We may, uh, I may just do a pop-up call for some ops stuff. Uh, you know, I, I think getting a schedule up quickly, like who are the guests and when is the first call and what is the schedule is important. So I'm going to focus on that a bit, uh, but thank you. And awesome. that conversation will be on the Mattermost? On ops? the Mattermost uh, WTW ops channel. Okay, great. Thanks. Bye everybody. Thank you. Yeah, bye-bye.